السلام عليكم ريوان uh, now we will record because uh, not everyone can uh, attend I will also start the video um, just for the introduction hopefully it's clear السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته today we'll have a talk with uh, Dr. Abdullah Zahrani uh, he's uh, an assistant professor in physics here at uh, KTPM since 2015 He, uh, he obtained his PhD uh, in 2014 uh, from the University of Alberta in black hole physics. He is interested generally in uh, theoretical physics, and particularly gravitational physics, uh, black hole physics, and uh, astrophysics, as well as uh, computational physics and uh, programming, and uh, maybe some other interests, uh, include psychology and uh, philosophy. So uh, we welcome you, Doctor, and um, oh, oh, we are looking forward to the talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to welcome everyone attending and those who are not attending, who are going to watch the recording. And uh, I'll try to make uh, this uh, presentation as informal as possible, right? As much informal as uh, possible. And I'll try to make it improvised so um, you can see that in the design of uh, the slides i um, i'm not going to mention details about almost everything and i'm expecting uh, questions to compensate for that so this is going to be like uh, an advertisement something like that right right in the beginning I really wanted to talk about gravitational waves, but then I said, well, this has exhausted many people since uh, the first detection, direct detection of gravitational waves. I've been talking about that. So let's talk about what is next. Now we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars, probably billions, And uh, so what? Why are we doing all of that? So uh, this presentation will try to address uh, the applications of gravitational wave physics. It's too early to talk about uh, gravitational waves communications, if possible at all. But there are very important applications, very big questions in astronomy, in, in cosmology, and theoretical physics to be answered. And the answer is encoded within uh, the rebels of gravitational waves. Right. Some history. The first reliable, by the way, I'm using my tablet because I, I can uh, write on the slides with, with my uh, pen. Uh, if, it, if it's not fast enough, uh, let me know. I have my laptop as well. I will uh, switch to my laptop. Right. So the first reliable theory of gravity was, I mean, reliable. It agrees with uh, observations. It gives predict predictions. It's the one made by Newton, right? Uh, that one described the gravitational fields of uh, celestial obje objects in, in our solar system in particular the sun, earth, moon, right, and other planets. Uh, this theory, Newtonian gravity theory, does not have any um, wave solution. After some time, Maxwell, this guy here is Maxwell, so he came up with a theory that unifies electricity and magnetism in one theory. And it was really astonishing that his equations have wave solutions, right? And it was found that this wave, what is what we are looking for, is a wave that describes light. It's a wave that is made of two fields, magnetic and uh, electric, indicate each other. And that was a great success of uh, Maxwell equations.
something interesting about Maxwell equations, they are compatible with the special theory of relativity. But Newtonian gravity is not. Right? The reason, simple reason for that, is that here the fields propagate the speed of light. Here, the field, I'll use G for gravitational field, propagates with, propagates with an infinite speed. And that's why this theory, the Newtonian theory, I will remove the cross from Newton, just as kind of suspect. Uh, so uh, the gravitational or the Newtonian gravitation does not have wave solution because the gravitational wave, wave uh, the gravitational field propagates at the speed of, of, of at an infinite speed. Okay. Uh, so it does not allow a wave solution. So scientists at that time thought about after the success of Maxwell, thought about why not we extend the Newtonian gravity, make it look like the Maxwell equation. We add an extra field, right? Then we can uh, make a theory that has fields pro propagating at the speed of light. It's compatible with the special theory of relativity, right? And this is the work that one that was done by Heaviside. If you're not familiar with who this guy is, he is Heaviside. You may have heard of the Heaviside function, Heaviside step function, right? Uh, the derivative of which is the delta function, right? So he extended, he introduced another field and extended the theory of Newton to make it look like that of Maxwell equation. And that theory, of course, predicted gravitational waves. It has gravitational solution. Yeah. In fact, I told you that it, must, it was made compatible with the special theory of relativity. At that time, this was then before uh, the introduction of the special theory of relativity. In fact, it was uh, Poincaré who uh, was concerned about the consistency of uh, special theory of relativity and Newtonian gravity. Also, he worked, he did the same thing, almost the same thing that uh, he decided did. But scientists did not like that. It looked too artificial. At the end, why do you assume the existence of another field similar to the magnetic field in electromagnetism. And that looked too artificial, right? Then in 1915 <laughs> came the theory of uh, general relativity, which naturally has gravitational wave solution, right? Uh, but the challenge, the challenge was to uh, prove that by an experiment. Special, the, the, the general theory of relativity, the Einstein field equation predicts many things, many unusual things like the expansion of the universe, existence of black holes, existence of gravitational waves, and all of these concepts looked weird and extreme at that time in the, let's say, 1920s, 1930s. You know, the theory itself was, uh, you know, under lots of criticism. Right. Right. Let's see how Sorry, um, Einstein, uh, go ahead. This is, wouldn't, or did they not think of, uh, or maybe come up with a way uh, in which they could link all three together? Uh, electric fields, magnetic fields, and uh, gravitational fields? Oh, that is a big step, right? Mm. Uh, in fact, the way to, to unify them is, is not like that. People, yeah, they try many things. For example, they may try to make them compatible with the, with the quantum theory. It's more important, right? And uh, there is success with E, M, right, E and M, strong force, 
uh, weak force, but gravitational force is uh, the, mo the most, let's say, uh, stubborn, right? That's why you, you, you keep hearing of uh, new theories like uh, super gravity, super string theory, uh, loop quantum gravity. All of these have the purpose of unifying gravity with the other forces of nature. And there is no reliable theory that unifies all of this together so far. It makes sense, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right. How does gravitational waves uh, get generated? Uh, just look at this picture and think of the analogy of uh, the water surface waves here. Here we have these uh, ducks or geese. I don't know. I think they are ducks. They are moving on the surface of, of the water. Now, if we have, if this is the surface of water, and here we have an object, a ball, beach ball, for example, it's going to make curvature in the surface of the water. Now, if this ball moves, right, it's going to, this curvature is going to move to the surrounding, it's going to propagate to the surrounding the surroundings of uh, the location of this ball, right? And all of you are familiar with that. So for example, as these ducks are moving, they are generating ripples, right? That are propagating away from the bird. They are into, their existence is independent of the existence of birds. I can now take, the birds can fly away, but the waves can remain there on the surface. As uh, John Wheeler uh, summarized the, special, the general theory of relativity, he said, matter tells space-time how to curve. Space-time tells matter how to move. So any matter is going to cause curvature in the structure of space-time and the fabric of space-time. And this curvature is extremely small. In other words, space-time is extremely stiff to bend. So you need very large objects, astronomical objects, to cause curvature in space-time, or let me say significant curvature in the space-time. Even a single atom causes curvature in space -time. Now, as these objects move, Fast enough, their curvature can spread around, just like uh, the water waves, right? Propagated or generated by uh, the ducks swimming on the surface of the water. So these are, this is in simple language, what, uh, how uh, gravitational waves are generated. Here, let's look at this animation which shows us how two uh, black holes generate gravitational waves. I want you to look at the very last moment. Now you will see some kind of uh, change in the view of the, in the background view, in the stars in the background. This is due, due to, in fact, uh, what is called gravitational lensing, right? Because of the space-time curvature, the light is bent just the same way it is bent with a lens, an optical lens. So you see some kind of waving in the background star, but this is not real gravitational waves. The effect of the gravitational waves is going to be seen in the last seconds of this animation. So I wanted to pay attention to that. Oh, okay. Did you see the effect at the very end or near the very end? Maybe here. Oh, this is not responding. I think that this computer is struggling with. Anyhow.
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly at this moment. It's about 27 seconds. Yeah. Now. Yeah. So we have curvature generated in space time. It will, prop it will propagate at the speed of light. It is independent of uh, the existence of the source. If we remove the source, if we take it away somehow, the gravitational waves will remain there. Okay. I want to move forward, but this is uh, yeah. Good. Now, gravitational waves, as I have said, they are uh, curvature in space time, and they are going to cause if we have two objects and the gravitational waves passes. The proper distance between these two objects is going to wave. It's going to change by delta x, right? X plus delta x. Okay. So it's going to get shorter and longer periodically, right? Due to the uh, grab the, the passage of the gravitational waves. Here, imagine and the atoms on a circle, right, on the leftmost graph or uh, figure, right, and see when the gravitational wave is uh, passing and the gravitational wave is traveling into the screen, right? We have different waves, different polarizations for the gravitational waves, right? We have the plus polarization, we have the cross polarization, the circular polarization, every one of these is going to have Dif uh, a different effect, but in general, they so as you can see here, these all atoms are going to move along this horizontal line. Atoms that are here, let me erase this. are going to look, move along the best vertical line. That's why we say this is a plus polarization. Here, we have the cross polarization. Maybe I go back a bit. Here two points, here and here, are going to move toward together and away from each other. The same thing for these two points here. So we have what is called the cross polarization. And here we have circular polarization, uh, similar to the case in, uh, in electromagnetic waves. On gravitational waves, they, they, they have wavelength. So if they pass through some structure, they will cause certain deformation that you will see in a minute. Yeah. So this is the deformation that is going to be generated due to the passage of the gravitational waves. You can see now uh, the effect of uh, the wavelength. Or the signature of the wavelength of the gravitation waves. Right. By the way, this is very, very much exaggerated. The change in length, you remember I wrote delta x plus delta x. If a gravitational wave comes from one side of the universe, and here we have the sun, Earth. If a gravitational wave passes, then this distance is going to change by this how much? 
the size of an atom, something ridiculously small, something of order 10 to the minus 20. Okay, that is delta x by x. Okay, so one meter is going to be changing by 10 to the minus 20 meters. So one, this is uh, far smaller than anything we have been uh, working with in our lives. Right. Let's here look at different sources of gravitational waves and at the gravitational wave spectrum that we will talk more about this in the coming slides. Uh, below here you see the method of the detection. Here we have ground-based or terrestrial, terrestrial interferometers, in particular Michelson interferometers. space-based interferometers that I will be talking about, and radio pulsar timing array. This is not based in interferometry. And finally, the CBM polarization. Different sources, for example, a supernova or certain processes in certain neutron stars called pulsars are going to generate high frequency gravitational waves of frequency about 100 Hertz. Measures of compact objects like black holes, neutron stars, black hole, neutron star, neutron star binary, they're going also to generate high frequency uh, gravitational waves, but also the frequency can be very low. Okay, so it is something in this interval. Supermassive black holes, they can also have binaries. You know that every galaxy has inside it at, at, at its center, a supermassive black hole. And the mass of a supermassive black hole, so if this is a galaxy, here we have a supermassive black hole with mass of order 10 to the uh, seven maybe, or six, to nine solar masses, okay? So it has big mass. Some galaxies don't have a supermassive black hole at their center. Why? Because due to the, due to the collision of two galaxies, one of the galaxies, probably the big one, is going to rip the black hole of the other galaxy. So it can end up having two black holes, two supermassive black holes. And these are going to spiral into each other and produce a bigger black hole, okay? So these are called supermassive black holes, binary mergers. And they generate gravitational waves that has, or that have very low frequency. What is the reason for that? Maybe I take you back to here. You remember this animation? Here, you have seen that gravitational waves are generated from the binary. In fact, the frequency of gravitational waves is equal to, or is about two times the orbital period of the binary. So if we have supermassive black holes, they are very, very big. And therefore, they have very long period. Oh, sorry. I, I, uh... okay. This is the power minus one. Okay. So, uh, supermassive black holes binaries, they have very long orbital period and therefore very low frequency. Okay. All of the information I'm telling now uh, will make sense why I'm talking about this later on. An important source of the of gravitational waves is not only compact objects. The Big Bang itself, the insulation 
the rapid expansion of the universe in the early universe. Okay, so, so these are sources of gravitation waves. But the frequency of these gravitational waves are ridiculously small. Just think of the length of, of the side of this gravitational wave, how long it is. Remember, so gravitational waves are the speed of light. Right? So divide this by the speed of light to get the wavelength. Uh, they reciprocate to get the uh, to get the wavelength. Okay, or the speed of light divided by this. So it's going to be, for example, for this frequency, it's going to be something of order 10 to the 14 plus 10 to the 8. So this is uh, 10 to the power 22 meters. Right. Now let's talk about detectors. Here we have gravitational wave from different sources, supernovae, in particular asymmetric supernovae, which are the collapse of large stars, mergers of compact objects, and processes in the early universe. If we get gravitational waves from these events, then they will tell us about the, the sources of these events, what happened, right? So we want to talk about detectors. By the way, do you have a plan for the timing of the class of, of uh, the presentation? Um, that be faster, slower, mention less details, more details? No, no, uh, as we're going right now, it seems, uh, seems okay. Oh, okay. So an hour, I think, is, uh, is acceptable. Okay, no, I, will, I will finish earlier so that we have, can have questions, discussions, right? Yeah, Bye. it's better. Yeah, so here, We have uh, the gravitation wave frequency. This is uh, here we have the strength of the gravitation wave, the effect of the gravitation wave. Right? Right? If this number is big, then the detection is easier. Right. Here, this region, right? Here we have gravitational waves that, is, that are coming from mergers of black holes, neutron stars, black hole neutron star binaries, right? You can see the intensity of gravitational waves is very small of order 10 to the minus 20 and less, right? I'm looking at this here, okay? So I need detectors that are sensitive enough so as you can see, new detectors, new generations of LIGO, LIGO detector, I'll be talking about that later, was recently able to achieve very high sensitivity. This was uh, the LIGO here, the LIGO before the upgrade. It wasn't sensitive enough, but the advanced one was maybe 10 times more sensitive. The same for Virgo in Italy, it wasn't sensitive enough. The advanced Virgo is as almost as sensitive as the advanced LIGO. And shortly, a few months after the discovery of the first gravitational wave uh, in LIGO, another one was uh, detected by Virgo detector, right? And in fact, it was detected in both LIGO and Virgo. Uh, Another one is going to be, uh, inshallah, placed by LIGO in India. The reason for that is they want to have, to make a triangle. One in, Europe, in Italy, one in the States, and one in India. So now if we get a signal from a source, we can locate that signal, right? Also, another one is being built in Japan, and uh, it is claimed to be the most sensitive, still in the construction, right? Now, to get gravitational waves from bigger sources, especially supermassive black holes, 
we need almost the same sensitivity. As you can see, the gravitational waves from the mergers of solar mass black holes are stronger. They are of order 10 to the minus 18, 100 times stronger, right? But the frequency is very small. And the Earth or the, the terrestrial detectors, LIGO, VERGO, GEO 600 and so on, these are not sensitive enough at low frequencies, right? Because we have lots of noise from seismic processes and other sources of noise. So the detectors are, these detectors are sensitive around 100 Hertz only, right? So another project was started, inshallah, it will be, it will start functioning in uh, 2034, hopefully earlier, inshallah, which is uh, Lisa, right? Uh, this was the first report of the project. In Lisa, which is a space-based detector. I will show you how it works in a minute. This has, is not, in, in terms of sensitivity, is not more sensitive than uh, this uh, ground-based or terrestrial detectors, but it's sensitive at very low frequencies, relatively low frequencies, so it can detect the signals coming from the mergers of black holes. More interesting detectors, not really, in fact, more interesting, but um, other class of detector is to use stars as detectors. And this is called the nanogravity project. The purpose of which is to detect gravitational waves with extremely small frequency, or the 10 to the minus eight. And gravity coming from the mergers of extremely very big black holes, supermassive black holes of massive order 10 to the nine solar masses, okay? But on all of these uh, observations are going to tell us a lot. I will tell you more about that. Um, other detectors that can tell us about the gravitational wave generated in the early universe are in fact indirect. In fact, our signatures of gravitation waves. I'll be talking about this later, inshallah, and why they are super important. Right. Uh, this here diagram shows you the basic operation of Michelson interferometer. I'm sure all of you have seen this if you have done physics 204. Did everyone here did physics 204? Yes, I think most of us. Okay, you have seen the Michelson interferometer, right? Yes, right. Okay, so uh, this LIGO and Virgo detectors are gravitational wave Michelson uh, interferometers. They are very sensitive in measuring distances. So uh, it has two arms, two perpendicular arms, and upon the passage of a gravitational wave, the length the proper length in fact of these arms are going to change. And therefore, you will see a movement in the fringes. Okay. Uh, as you can see, something interesting. Yeah, exactly like what you did in the lab of uh, 204. Something good here is that you can send the light to go back and forth many times. And that's going to increase the effective length of uh, the arms, right? And hence increase the sensitivity. So uh, you can go and watch documentaries on YouTube about uh, these detectors and the technologies that are used, how they hold the metals floating, yeah, and it's, uh, let's say, real headache, right, to keep the system operating. I'm 
Another system, very promising one, is called LISA, proposed by the European Space Agency, that we have satellites far enough from Earth so that uh, it will not get noises, disturbances from uh, the gases of uh, the atmosphere of Earth. And you can see here the arm length, the side of the triangle can be, the proposed length is 1 million kilometers. And uh, it will be easy. Again, it uses uh, Michelson interferometers and it can detect very small uh, variations in the length of this, uh, of, of, of uh, the size of the triangle. The light, by the way, here doesn't go multiple times, just directly from one mirror, from one satellite to, other, to, to the other. If they make it like that, you know, the, light, the light goes back and forth multiple times, of LIGO, they are going to increase the efficiency significantly. But this is sensitive enough to detect the low uh, frequency gravitational wave sources or signals. All right, now let's talk about detections. You know, the earliest detections were made. The earliest one was made, was made in, in LIGO. Then another one was made in Virgo. Then many were detected in both LIGO and Virgo. There is now cooperation between the two. And uh, in fact, the detectors are receiving signals all the time, 24 hours. And the data is given to supercomputers. And the supercomputer uses artificial intelligence to look for promising signals, right? And now we have, in fact, like it is, is, uh, consists of two observatories, right, in the States. We have Virgo, so if there is a signal detected, we are going to compare the signal, the signals from the three stations at the same time. Uh, these are all of these are detections by LIGO. They are signals of two black holes. See how they name the event, gravitational waves, right? And 2015, September 14, this was the first signal, and so on. Notice the relation between the frequency of the wave and the orbital period of the binary. Uh, this video is very long. I'm not going to wait for it to end. But now here we start writing. I cannot exit the writing mode. Maybe I need to quit. Okay, come back. Did, it, did, it, did this tell us something? Yes. It had changed our understanding of black holes. Black hole, the smallest black hole ever discovered was about three solar masses. The largest was about 15 solar masses. So this class of black holes is called spillar mass black holes. Okay. But the mergers that gave us gravitational waves after analyzing the signal, it belongs to black holes that are far than the gravitational waves that we observed before from the accretion disk. Now, if there is a black hole, we look at, it, at its accretion disk, we analyze the X-ray coming from the accretion disk around the black hole, and we get information about the black hole. So these are called here electromagnetic black holes. 
Notice that all of the electromagnetic black holes we discovered are very small. Most of them are less than 20 uh, solar masses, okay? Around 20 or less solar masses, okay? Not all of them are included, by the way. But these that gave us gravitational wave signals, they have new uh, ranges of masses. For example, here, we have a black hole of about 38 solar masses and another one with 30 solar masses, combining, producing a black hole of about 70 solar masses. We have never seen black holes like that. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the first lesson to learn from the gravitational wave detection, is that stellar mass black holes are from three to about 100 solar masses. So going to solve a problem in astrophysics. There are three classes of black holes classified by mass. Solar mass black holes. Okay. Less than 15 solar masses. Supermassive black holes, which has masses of millions to billions solar masses. And intermediate black holes, which have intermediate mass black holes which is supposed to be the link between the two, and they have masses of about 1,000 solar masses. They have never been found. There are candidates, but no intermediate, intermediate, black hole, intermediate mass black hole has been detected so far. But this here, these black holes tell us that there are bigger black holes that we did not detect yet. All the gravitational waves told us about their existence. Another interesting event, it was detected in both LIGO and Virgo in Italy, was the merger of two neutron stars. This was really exciting. I'll tell you later why. Okay, so two neutron stars combined and produced another object. It's unknown if it's uh, another black hole, a uh, black hole or another neutron star. Because the neutron stars, you may know that they have an upper limit of about three solar masses. Any neutron star more than that, if it doesn't have enough strong enough magnetic field, it's going to collapse into a black hole. Mm, right. Right. By analyzing the signal, the arrival time, now we have two detectors in the States, both are LIGO detectors, right? By comparing the arrival time of the signal, the first detection, right, was this one here, was located to be coming from this part of the sky. You see the uncertainty is large. For the second detection, still large, third and fourth. But after the detection of this event, this event was the merger of two neutron stars that I have shown to you on the previous slides. This one here, this event. It was detected in LIGO and Virgo. So we were able to find the exact, uh, the exact place from which uh, the gravitational wave came, right? When two black holes merge and form a bigger black hole, no electromagnetic radiation is produced at all. Nothing is produced except a new black hole plus gravitational waves. So this event is very silent. By the way, the gravitational wave produced in the merge of two black holes is very, very, very luminous, very powerful event. In fact, at the last moments of the merger, the amount of energy converted from mass to gravitational waves is more than the amount of energy converted from mass to light by all stars that we can see. All stars combined are weaker than this event. 
But again, we can see this event of black hole, black hole, bigger black hole, only via gravitational waves. The story is different when we have two neutron stars. Right? We can observe this. Uh, we don't care about this, whether it's a neutron star or black hole. But this event is going to produce, first of all, light, neutrinos, and gravitational waves. So uh, this was, this event announced the real birth of what is called the multi-messenger, multi-messenger astronomy. Mm, I moved uh, forward by mistake. So we get a signal, we have an event and we get signals in different forms. And we can use these signals to find different information. For example, after the discovery of this event by a gravitational wave, there was an announcement from LIGO and Virgo to all telescopes to look at this uh, side of uh, the sky. So at that time, about 70 telescopes, right? About 70 telescopes were, why well, this is not right. Yeah, about 70 telescopes were pointed, right? Toward this event. And they found at this point that there is a very powerful explosion here. Something that is called, you have heard of the nova and supernova, right? Yes, yes, and there's type All one right. and type two supernova. Yeah, but this one is called a kilonova. Kilonova. Okay. Kilonova. What happens a kilonova is the following. Because of the explosion, because uh, the two neutron stars merge, uh, lots of nuclei, very active nuclei, are produced. They are very unstable, so they will try to stabilize by uh, radiating. They will radiate heavily, and the result is, go is that we are going to have a very big sphere, very large sphere, with luminosity equal to the luminosity of the sun from this radioactive material, uh, nuclear. So the debris of the merge of two neutron stars is going to produce a big ball that is as luminous as the sun itself. Just imagine, imagine how exciting that, right? By observing these events, we learned many things. You know that in stars, uh, some atoms are produced in the early universe, by the way, only hydrogen, helium, and probably some lithium was produced. And stars produce the heavy, limb, heavy elements, right? But not, especially the very heavy ones are not produced efficiently. They are produced in the explosion of the, super, in the, star, of the star, the supernova or the supernovae, right? the core collapse of now in particular. Another source of this that we have recently learned about is the kilonova, okay, or the merge of two neutron stars. This is a source of the heavy elements you see in the periodic table. Right. This is one. This kind of signal can tell us also about the structure of neutron stars. The structure of neutron stars, you know, neutron stars are like, if a white dwarf is a large atom, if a white dwarf is a large atom, then the neutron star is a large nucleus. And to have a nucleus that is about 10 kilometers in diameter, the equation of state or the structure of the core of neutron star is very unknown, especially the innermost layers. We don't know. 
One of the theories predict that there is inside it, this is what is called charm star. Have you heard of the charm star? No, it's the first time. This is made of material made of, yeah, made of charm quarks. What? And Just made of only charm, charm quarks? Yes. And the bad thing about this is that this material is contagious. After the explosion of this star, small pieces, small chunks of the star, of, uh, charm star can fly away in the universe. And if they fall on a star, what will happen? This is going to be like yeast. Like when you throw bacteria inside, like when you take, uh, just a droplet of yogurt and place it in milk. After some time, it will become completely yogurt, right? So this is very contagious, more contagious than the coronavirus. It will convert any star even if it is a main sequence, main sequence star, a yani young star, to, uh, to uh, a charm star. It will made it completely made of charm quartz. This is one of the predictions, uh, by the way, one of the theories about it. So the structure of Angel star is very unknown. What can tell us about it is the merger of neutron star. So the text, uh, in fact, uh, the, the events of uh, merging neutron stars are by far more important, or let's say more important than the merger of black holes. Okay, small black holes. Right. Something that is very perplexing is the existence of supermassive black hole. Where did they come from? A black hole of mass of 10 to the six to the nine solar masses. How did this form? And why every galaxy has one at the center? Was it necessary for the formation of the galaxy? Was it like the seed around which the galaxy was formed? This is very mysterious. This is one of the big questions of uh, theoretical physics to be answered. Also, a question related to the formation of the jets. By the way, this is a galaxy, an elliptical galaxy. And inside it, there is an active black hole. Sometimes this region is called the AG, active AGN, active galactic nuclei. The engine of which is a supermassive black hole. It is producing jets along the spin axis of the black hole. And you can see the spins are bigger than the, the, the galaxy, the parent galaxy itself. How did this form? What can tell us about is Lisa, right? And this is inshallah assembled in uh, inshallah in less than there are some predictions that will be produced, inshallah, within a decade, okay, or before, uh, before, inshallah, 2030. So if that is produced, if that is uh, constructed, we will be able to detect gravitational wave sources, gravitational wave sources, in particular, the mergers of two massive black holes. So this will tell us if these black holes were formed from small black holes and multiple mer merging processes that produce a big black hole, or whether these were born in the early universe, this was predicted by Stephen Hawking. Uh, there are, the Big Bang itself could have made black holes, very small black holes, the size of proton, and the mass of which is very large, 10 to the 18 kilograms. This is normal for a black hole. Yani. So 
are these black holes? Do they do they come from these black holes that were formed in the universe? So to have answers to these questions, we need to look at signals from mergers of supermassive black holes or large black holes. Have you seen this picture before? Yes, I think we've all seen pictures or at least similar to it. Yeah, its name is what? This picture is the oldest picture that you may have ever seen. I think it's uh, the deep... Uh, yeah, yeah, Hubble Deep Field. Yeah. And uh, this is how the universe looked 12 billion years or giga years in the, back, in the past. This is how the universe looked like when it was about 1.8 giga years. You can see many galaxies are have not become, become regular enough at that time. Inshallah, James Webb Telescope, you have heard of it, right? Is going to get better picture for uh, the Hubble uh, for for the deep field images. Uh, this was collected, in fact, by long exposure, about 10 hours. You look at small region of space, just like the size of a grain of sand. And you put your telescope to that direction, collect light for 10 hours, add the pictures digitally, you get something like this. Right. If we have the look back time, if we look at very far source, then you are seeing the light that was emitted 12 billion, if the source is 12 billion light years away, the light that will reach us now is the light that was emitted 12 billion years in the past. This is called the look back time. James Webb telescope is going to give us inshallah more pictures of uh, earlier picture, let me say, okay, more or greater or earlier look back time. But how early can we go? Is there a limit to that? What do you think? I think yes, there is a point of uh, like the starting point. There is the Big Bang? No, yeah. we cannot go, we cannot go to the Big Bang. Why? There is what is called the recombination time. Let me write here. So at certain time of the, of the age of the universe, right? At maybe, let's say 400 thousand years, the universe was very hot and atoms did not form. What we had is plasma. Basically protons and electrons. So, this is like um, a liquid metal. So the universe was opaque before that time. It was very hot. Atoms are ionized. If a light is emitted, it's going to be absorbed by these electrons, re-emitted, scattered. So light cannot travel, travel freely, so the universe was opaque. At this time, when the universe cooled down and the first atoms formed, the universe has been transferred for the first time. This is called the recombination time. This is the earliest we can see, right? So if we look further, we have better telescope, better than the wind sweep. We're going to see the earliest stars, then clouds of hydrogen, then that's it, nothing earlier, because the universe was okay. Uh, by the way, the cosmic microwave, the first burst of light that was emitted that time has been redshifted continuously by the expansion of the universe. And now it is in 
the microwave, uh, the microwave range or microwave frequencies. And this is what the microwave or the cosmic microwave background radiation. I think you have all heard about this, right? The background radiation of the universe. It's coming from this event. What is good about gravitational waves? Gravitational waves, by the way, they get hardly scattered. They get hardly uh, absorbed, okay? They travel through almost anything. So uh, the recombination time for gravitational waves is far, far, far earlier. Something that has to do with the quantum gravity era, something of order 10 to the minus 40 seconds. Can you believe that? So gravitational waves from the time before the recombination time can tell us about what happened in the early stages of the universe, shortly after the Big Bang, and in an important period, which is the inflation, inflation, the rapid expansion of the universe. All of these have gravitational wave signatures, right? So, uh, this background radiation, correspond to this time, the recombination time. And what is before cannot be seen. How can it be seen? Only through gravitational waves. Excuse me, sir. Go ahead. Uh, what is the source exactly of the background radiation? Where does it exactly uh, it, come from? It's a black body. It's a black body. Uh-huh. Is the, yeah, a, the radiation yeah. of... Uh, black body radiation. Of heat. It is the most perfect black body ever. The most perfect. The error bars are magnified 400 times in the graph that you find on the internet. And still, they are exactly on the curve. Right. Something very important that we learned from the discovery of gravitation waves was uh, that Einstein field equations has survived the last test, the ultimate test, right? Uh, in fact, another one came after, which is, I talked about it in a seminar, which was uh, Event Horizon Telescope, watching the Event Horizon of the telescope. But, so, but, but this one, the existence of gravitational waves, first of all, its speed was measured. It was C. Other theories of gravity predict gravitation waves, but with speed different than C. So they are all now ruled out. And this theory here never broke down, except when you go to quantum, to the quantum world, you see it has problems. So uh, the detection of gravitational waves had theoretical values, right? Has great theoretical value. Uh, it's, it told us about how good our theories are. Right, so that's it. Thank you for listening. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Zakir, for this uh, wonderful presentation. This is uh, very insightful. Thank you. And uh, yes, we open the uh, door to any any questions um, from students. I mean, uh, maybe before, uh, whilst they are uh, thinking of some questions, uh, in in terms of the uh, neutrinos, um, because we know that they're very. Uh, I mean, you would need very sensitive um, devices and uh, instruments to measure them. How are they? Right detected uh, exactly they have underground uh, detectors for it like the chemu candy super chemu candy uh, detectors they are underground have you seen the chemu candy uh, detector before i uh, know i 
حلو. It has it has it, it was made in in uh, in uh, a mine underground mine. There is a huge lake of extra pure water, right? So when a, a neutrino passes, and an event is recorded, it's going to generate certain photons, and it is surrounded by thousands of photomultipliers. Okay, like the eyes of um, maybe uh, what is that called? I forgot its name. Like uh, the cells in, in the eyes of some insects, right? And these photomultipliers, giant photomultipliers, try to detect that electron, that uh, photon, right? Which is the signature of uh, the interaction of the neutron, right? So uh, this is one way to do it. There are other ways, right? You can read about it. Like, for example, Babar project. Right, and uh, when it comes to, let's say, uh, interactions in space and uh, certain events that occur there, uh, is there no way of measuring those neutrinos? Or is it just... Yeah, one event, one event, it was a supernova. It was detected. Uh, it was in one of the Magellanic clouds, an interesting event. It's called the uh, 1985 event, right? It was discovered by Hoppius, uh, who put his camera to get a long exposure picture, and he found a supernova, announced that all telescopes were pointed toward that supernova. And at the same time, or uh, at the time corresponding to the time of the explosion, a, uh, a signal was received in uh, the chemical and the uh, neutrino detector in Japan. Hmm. So because the core collapse uh, of a star, core collapse supernova, there is uh, the, uh, significant, significant emissions of uh, neutrinos. So neutrinos were detected from that event. Oh, okay. In fact, don't expect so many events, about 10 events. Yeah, I mean, we get about like one, two, zero events in the background noise. One, two, zero. During the supernova, they get about 10 events at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cross section of it is really, really small. The other, uh, any other questions? Yes, me. Go ahead. Uh, for, while a body is moving and producing uh, gravitational waves, does that uh, change the total energy of body? Is it part of the body? Yeah, there is energy and momentum associated with uh with the generation of gravitational waves. So momentum and uh, energy is conserved. So if the total event, the body let's... Lose energy. Uh, sorry? The body will lose energy due to the... Yeah, so let's say the total masses of this is 80 solar masses. The neutrons, the, the, the black hole, resultant black hole is going to be smaller by about, let's say, two to three solar masses. So two to three solar masses of black hole mass was converted to gravitational waves. All right, thank you. Interesting, you may say, oh, okay, this is a good mechanism to extract energy from black hole. Mm. <laughs> but it's yeah, very it weak, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it's not weak. It's not weak. Its effect is very weak, but it's not weak. Something good about gravitational waves. Now, when we detect, when we detect an electromagnetic wave, we, methanol, there is light coming from a star or from an LED, let's say. We want to absorb photon, right? So we'll take the energy of that thing. So the energy is proportional to the electric field square energy, the energy of an electromagnetic is proportional to the electric field square. 
So we are detecting the electric field square, right? Which is proportional to one over R squared. In gravitational waves, we don't get absorbed the, the energy of the wave and measure. No, we measure its effect. So in fact, we are measuring the field itself. Let me call it G, not G squared. So this is proportional to one over R only. So gravitational waves fall as one over R, not one, as one over R squared. This is really great. And if you have a source that is one million light years away, the light from it is going to fall down significantly. But gravitational waves will fall by a factor that is 1,000 times less than that of uh, one million times that of uh, the gravity of, of uh, the electromagnetic wave by which the electromagnetic waves have, has been reduced. Does the gravitational wave actually uh, propagate uh, through a medium or just the space-time? Can we see the space-time is medium? Space-time, no, no. Yeah, so it doesn't need a medium. It doesn't need a medium. But it's, it's if it needs a medium, it's going to cause a problem mm -hmm. that's going to violate the the principle of relativity, just like ether for electromagnetic waves. Yeah, I mean like that. No, they travel, of course, in, uh, in vacuum. And they travel, the, the, the scattering is extremely weak. They never get, almost never get absorbed, deflected, nothing happens to them. Except, of course, when they uh, face some uh, very compact object, object that is generating lots of uh, space-time curvature, methane and black hole. Then the gravitational wave can get reflected by the black hole surface. Interesting. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, you're most welcome. Well, Dr. I have one more question. Um, you mentioned that, uh, at the end that uh, there's uh, an issue when we uh, attempt to uh, understand, let's say, gravitation waves uh, within the let's say, world of quantum mechanics. Uh, what exactly is the issue? Or what are the problems that um, don't allow us to let's say, include it within the quantum theory? OK, uh, first of all, uh, gravitation waves have has description in quantum world, right? So the quantum of gravitation is called uh, graviton. It's a spin two particle. Um, why it is incompatible? Because it doesn't work simply. When you try, for example, to do something simple, yani مثلاً, you try to, a first step to quantum gravity is to try to write the particle physics that we know in case space time. Yani, we describe, for the experiments that we that are happening in accelerators every day near the surface of black hole, right? And you will see that you get lots of uh, divergences. The theories are not uh, normalizable, right? You have some, there are some technical issues of quantum field theory that um, I'm trying to avoid now, but it doesn't work, simple answer. You get a divergent theory, non-normalizable, that is uh, total nonsense. You don't get equations that work you know that there is something wrong. And would you say that um, that's because of, let's say, our uh, limitation or uh, our misunderstanding or our incomplete understanding? Or... Yeah, 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 it's incomplete. Yeah, incomplete. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, thanks. Thanks for your time. Uh,
we we learned a lot and we definitely opened the door to a whole other field. Okay, great. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. If you please, I have one question. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, first, thank you, Doctor, for uh, your great presentation. I'm very thankful and grateful for that. Uh, second, I would like actually to know whether we expect any applications, especially in the industrial sector, out of the knowledge uh, about uh, gravitational waves and all the story of cos cosmology, especially. You mean uh, gravitational waves communication, cell phones that work in gravitational waves, something like that? Yeah, yeah, you can say that. Well, uh, are you an engineer? Are you an engineering major? Uh, no, actually, I'm a physics. Uh, oh, okay, physics major. Okay, okay. Uh, these questions are being asked all the time. Why are, you doing, why you are doing this? What is the purpose of this? What is the benefit of this? Uh, same questions were posed on Maxwell equations. You have seen Maxwell equations in uh, simple form in physics 204, mm. right? At the end of Halliday and Resnick. You will see it in more beautiful way, inshallah, in three or six. Uh, and people were saying, so what? You found the theory for the two, so what? But everything now relies on Maxwell. Theory of uh, electromagnetism, right? All of the technology mm. we have is, uh, in a sense, electromagnetic. So, well, I can't talk about this in detail, but, uh, Valuing science for it is is more than enough. You agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, we can we can agree with that, doctor. But is there any idea or any expectation? Let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you one thing. All human mathematics and physics came from space. Early mathematics was made or came from space by observing sun and moon and we learned everything by looking at by watching the sky and mm -hmm. the process is going on mm -hmm. uh, but, but to mention i'm not uh, trying to be uh, pragmatic but i'm saying if there is any potential applications out of this knowledge or something we aim to achieve out of the knowledge of uh, gravitational waves for example um, what is the existence of charm matter for example the existence of uh, charm course exists to another but the existence of the structure, the equation of state of neutron stars, they will help us a lot. What we, uh, in fact, learned, what we assumed is that uh, the nuclear structure or the nuclear processes are similar to those that we watch in uh, nuclear reactors, right? Mm -hmm. So, understanding the equation of state of neutron stars can help us understand uh, nuclear physics better. Oh. Now nuclear yes. fusion reactors are just, uh, we're trying, uh, they just resemble stars, right? I'm not really sure. Yeah, they do, they do. You have hydrogen as fuel, you make helium. Helium was derived from the word Helios. Helios means sun. Or um, I think the god of the sun in Greek, something like that. Mm -hmm. Because it was first discovered in the sun. So. 
So there are many, many things, almost everything we have learned from stars. The model for solids and solid state physics, you have the electron gas. Have you heard of the electron gas in condensed matter physics and solid state physics? This was first worked or produced works. Then it was applied to describe metals. Uh, thank you, Rexa, for this interesting knowledge. Thank you. You're most welcome. Yes, we thank you again, Doctor, and uh, hopefully we can uh, meet uh, face to face, uh, hopefully as early as uh, next semester. Inshallah, I don't think so, but uh, Inshallah, we'll be meeting you. Inshallah, Inshallah. I'd like to also thank the uh, attendees, especially those who uh, waited and stayed till the end. And uh, Inshallah, we'll meet again in the future weeks with the other weekly meetings. Assalamu alaikum.